Chapter 1. The Royals. More than a crown. Long, long ago, there wasn't a place called Britain, and there certainly wasn't a royal family. But over time, as people moved around and set up homes, countries began to form. One of these countries became Britain, and it was here that the British royal family was born. The story of the British royal family starts more than a thousand years ago, during a time called the Middle Ages. In those days, the country was divided into many small areas, each one ruled by a powerful person, known as a lord. These lords owned large pieces of land and had many people working for them. As time went by, some lords became more powerful than others. They started to control not just one area, but many areas. These powerful lords became known as kings and queens. The first king of England was a man named William the Conqueror, who came to power in 1066. He started the tradition of a single family, the royal family, ruling the country. Over the years, the royal family grew in size and power. They were not just the rulers of the country, they also became important figures in society. They set the fashion trends, decided on the laws, and even influenced the way people spoke. The royal family also became famous for their grand palaces and castles, beautiful clothes, and fabulous parties. These things made them seem almost magical, and many ordinary people looked up to them. But being royal wasn't just about having nice things. It was also about duty and responsibility. The king or queen had to look after the country and make sure it was safe and successful. They had to make important decisions that could affect millions of people. It was a very big job. Over time, the royal family changed and evolved, but they always remained an important part of British society. Even today, more than a thousand years later, the royal family is still very much a part of Britain. They continue to play a big role in the country's traditions and culture, and they are still loved and respected by many people. And that's how the British royal family came to be. They started as powerful lords, became kings and queens, and grew into a family that has shaped Britain for over a thousand years. They are truly more than just a crown. They are a vital part of Britain's history and identity. Traditions are like the stories we tell again and again. They remind us of our past and help shape our future. The British royal family has many traditions that have been passed down from one generation to the next. One of the most famous traditions is the changing of the guard. This is a grand ceremony that happens every day at Buckingham Palace, the home of the Queen. During this ceremony, a group of soldiers, known as guards, march in front of the palace. They wear bright red uniforms and tall, black hats. This ceremony is a symbol of the Queen's protection and a great attraction for many visitors. Another royal tradition is the Queen's speech. Every year, at Christmas, the Queen gives a speech that is broadcast on television. In her speech, the Queen reflects on the past year and shares her hopes for the future. This tradition started with the Queen's grandfather, King George V, and continues to this day. The royal family also has traditions for special events, like weddings and birthdays. For example, royal weddings are often held at Westminster Abbey, a beautiful old church in London. After the wedding, the newly married couple usually appears on the balcony of Buckingham Palace to wave to the crowds. This tradition started with Queen Victoria and has continued with recent royal weddings. Birthdays are another special time for royal traditions. The Queen has two birthdays. Her real birthday in April and her official birthday in June. On her official birthday, there is a big parade called Trooping the Colour. Soldiers march through the streets of London, and the royal family watches from a balcony. It's a day of great celebration. These are just a few of the many traditions that the royal family keeps alive. Some of these traditions are hundreds of years old, 
but they are still celebrated today. They connect the past to the present and remind us of the royal family's long history. Keeping traditions alive is a big part of being royal. It's a way of honouring the past and carrying it forward into the future. These traditions make the royal family unique and help them to stand out in a modern world. And, in a way, they remind us that the royal family is more than just a family. They are the keepers of Britain's history and heritage. Life in the 21st century is very different from life a thousand years ago, or even just a hundred years ago. We now have things like smartphones, the internet, and fast cars. The world is changing rapidly, and everyone has to adapt, even the royal family. Despite their long history and old traditions, the British royal family has shown an impressive ability to keep up with the times. They have found ways to continue their roles and responsibilities while adapting to the modern world. For example, they now use social media. Yes, you heard right, the royal family is on social media. They have official accounts on platforms like Twitter and Instagram. These accounts share photos and updates about the royal family's activities. They show the royals attending events, meeting people, or even just going about their everyday lives. This is a way for them to connect with people all over the world, especially with the younger generation. The royal family has also started to take on modern issues. They use their influence to bring attention to important topics such as mental health, climate change, and education. Princes William and Harry, along with their wives Kate and Meghan, have been particularly involved in these efforts. They have launched campaigns and initiatives to raise awareness and help make a difference. This shows that the royal family is not just about tradition and history, they are also about progress and change. Furthermore, the royal family has become more open and personal in the way they interact with the public. They share more about their personal lives and experiences. They show that they too have joys and challenges, hopes and fears, just like anyone else. This has helped them to stay relatable and relevant in a world where people value authenticity and connection. However, while the royal family has adapted to the modern world, they have not forgotten their history. They continue to uphold their traditions and play their ceremonial roles. They keep their connection to the past while also looking towards the future. This balance between the old and the new is a big part of what makes the royal family unique. In the end, the royal family's ability to adapt shows that they are more than just a symbol of history. They are a living, evolving part of Britain. They are a bridge that connects the past, present and future. They are, indeed, more than just a crown. Chapter 2 Public Life and Private Life Being a member of the royal family is not just about living in grand palaces and attending fancy parties. It also involves a lot of hard work. The royal family has many duties and responsibilities that they must carry out in their public roles. The Queen, as the head of the royal family, has the most responsibilities. She is also the head of state, which means she represents the country in a symbolic way. The Queen does not make laws or decisions about running the country, that's the job of the government. But she does have important ceremonial duties. She meets with important visitors from other countries, gives out awards to people who have done great things, and attends many events to support charities and community organisations. The Queen also has a weekly meeting with the Prime Minister, the leader of the government. In these meetings, the Prime Minister updates the Queen about what is happening in the country and the world. This is an important tradition that helps the Queen stay informed about the issues affecting her people. Other members of the royal family also have public duties. They often represent the Queen at events or on trips to other countries. These trips, called royal tours, are a way for the royal family to build good relationships with other countries. The royals also support many charities and causes. They use their influence to bring attention to these causes and help them succeed. 
One of the most important duties of the royal family is to be a symbol of national unity and continuity. They are a link to the country's history and traditions. They are there in times of celebration, like weddings and birthdays, and in times of sadness, like funerals or national tragedies. They bring people together and help them feel a sense of pride and belonging. Being a member of the royal family can be a lot of work. It's not a nine-to-five job. It's a lifelong commitment. The royals often have long days filled with meetings, events, and lots of travel. They have to always be ready to put their best foot forward, to be kind and patient, and to show their love for their country. But despite the hard work, the royal family takes their duties very seriously. They understand that they have a role to play in making their country and the world a better place. They are dedicated to serving their people and carrying on the traditions that have been passed down to them. For them, being royal is not just about privilege. It's about duty, service and responsibility. When we think of the royal family, we often think of their public roles and responsibilities. But just like us, they also have a private life. They have hobbies, interests and personal moments that are often hidden from the public eye. Let's take a peek behind the palace doors and discover what the royals do when they're not on duty. The Queen, even with her busy schedule, has a few hobbies that she enjoys. One of her most known hobbies is her love for dogs, particularly gorgeous. These small, lively dogs have been her companions for many years. The Queen also enjoys horse riding and spends time each year at her private estates where she can ride and enjoy the countryside. In addition, she is known to be a keen gardener and takes great pride in the beautiful gardens of her homes. Prince Charles, the Queen's eldest son, is passionate about nature and the environment. He loves gardening and even has his own organic farm. He spends a lot of time tending to his plants and learning about sustainable farming practices. His sons, Princes William and Harry are both sports enthusiasts. They enjoy playing polo, a fast-paced horseback sport, and they often participate in charity matches. They also love football and are known to support their favourite teams. Kate, the wife of Prince William, is a keen photographer and often shares her own photos of her children for official releases. She also loves the outdoors and often takes her children on nature walks. Meghan, Prince Harry's wife, has a passion for food and cooking. She used to share recipes on her lifestyle blog before she became a royal. She also enjoys yoga and has a strong interest in promoting women's rights. Despite their royal status, the members of the royal family also have to deal with everyday tasks. They go shopping, take their children to school, and even cook their meals, although they do have staff to help them with these tasks. However, their private lives are not entirely private. Being a royal means being in the public eye, and sometimes their personal moments are shared with the world. But they try to protect their private lives as much as possible, to have a sense of normalcy amidst their royal duties. Overall, the royal family, just like us, enjoys simple pleasures and personal hobbies. They cherish the moments away from the limelight, where they can just be themselves. It's a reminder that despite their titles and duties, there are real people with real lives beyond their royal roles. Being a member of the royal family might seem like a dream come true. Living in grand palaces, wearing beautiful clothes, attending fancy parties, it all sounds very glamorous. But being royal also comes with its own set of challenges. Let's take a closer look at some of the difficulties that the royal family faces because of their public roles and responsibilities. One of the biggest challenges is the constant public scrutiny. The royal family is always in the public eye. Every move they make, every word they say, is watched and analysed by people all over the world. This can put a lot of pressure on them to always act perfectly. Any mistake or misstep 
can quickly become a big news story. Privacy is another big issue. The royal family has very little privacy. Photographers, known as paparazzi, often try to take pictures of them in their private moments. These pictures are then sold to newspapers and magazines. This can make it difficult for the royals to relax and enjoy their personal time. The royal family also has to deal with the pressure of expectations. They are expected to behave in a certain way, to uphold certain traditions, and to represent their country in the best possible way. These expectations can be very high and sometimes difficult to meet. In addition, the royal family faces the challenge of balancing their public duties with their private lives. They have to find time for their personal interests and for spending time with their families, while also fulfilling their public responsibilities. This can be a difficult balance to maintain. Being a royal also means dealing with the pressure of succession. The line of succession determines who will become the next king or queen. This can put pressure on the person next in line, as they have to prepare for the day when they will take on the role of monarch. Finally, being a royal often means sacrificing personal desires for the sake of duty. For example, King Edward VII had to give up his throne because he wanted to marry a woman who was not considered suitable for a king. Princess Margaret also had to say goodbye to the man she loved because her family did not approve. Despite these challenges, the royal family continues to carry out their duties with dedication and grace. They understand that these challenges are part of their role, and they are committed to serving their country and their people. They remind us that being royal is not just about the glamour and the glory. It's also about duty, responsibility, and sometimes personal sacrifice. Chapter 3. Edward VIII the king who left the throne. Edward VIII was born on June 23, 1894. His full name was Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David, but he was often called David by his family. He was the eldest son of King George V and Queen Mary, which made him the heir to the throne, the next in line to be king. Edward's early years were filled with all the things you would expect for a future king. He had the best education, with tutors who taught him at home. He learned about history, languages, and how to be a good leader. He also learned how to ride horses and play polo, which became one of his favourite sports. As a young man, Edward was very charming and handsome. He was popular with the people and was known for his good manners and friendly nature, but he was also known for being a bit of a rebel. He liked to break the rules and do things his own way. This made him different from his father, who was very serious and strict. Edward also liked to travel. He visited many countries and met many different people. These travels helped him learn about the world and gave him a broader perspective on life. He was particularly interested in modern ideas and technologies. He was one of the first members of the royal family to learn how to fly a plane. However, Edward's life was not all fun and games. He also had to prepare for his future role as king. This meant learning about the duties and responsibilities of a monarch. He had to understand how the government works, how to deal with other countries, and how to represent his own country in the best possible way. Despite the pressures of his role, Edward seemed to enjoy his life. He was a popular figure, both at home and abroad. But his love for freedom and his desire to do things his own way would eventually lead to a big decision, a decision that would shock the world and change the course of history. Edward's early years set the stage for his later actions. They show us a young man who was not afraid to be different, who valued freedom and individuality, and who was willing to make tough decisions for the sake of his personal happiness. His story reminds us that even kings are human, with their own dreams and desires, and sometimes those dreams and desires can be more important than a crown. Edward VIII 
became king on January 20, 1936, following the death of his father, King George V. However, his reign would prove to be one of the shortest in British history. Just 11 months later, he made the shocking decision to abdicate, to give up the throne. This part of his life is often referred to as the abdication crisis. The reason for Edward's abdication was love. He had fallen for an American woman named Wallace Stimson. Wallace was vivacious, charismatic and stylish, and Edward was completely captivated by her. They met in 1931 and quickly became close. By the time Edward became king, they were deeply in love. However, there was a problem. Wallace was not considered a suitable match for a king. She was a divorcee, having been married twice before, and she was still married to her second husband when she and Edward started their relationship. At that time, divorce was looked down upon, especially in the Church of England, of which the king is the head. Marrying a divorcer was seen as unacceptable. Edward was faced with a choice. He could give up Wallace and stay on as king, or he could give up the throne for the woman he loved. It was a difficult decision. As king, he had a duty to his country and his people. But as a man, he wanted to be with the woman he loved. In the end, Edward chose love. On December 10, 1936, he signed the papers that officially made him no longer king. He announced his decision in a radio broadcast, telling the people of Britain that he could not be an effective king without the help and support of the woman I love. It was a moment that shocked the world. Edward's decision to abdicate was a bold and unprecedented move. It showed that he was willing to give up power and prestige for the sake of his personal happiness. It also showed that he was a man of his own mind, willing to go against tradition and expectations. The abdication crisis was a major event in British history. It changed the course of the monarchy, and it left a lasting impact on the royal family. But for Edward, it was a personal decision, a choice between duty and love, and he chose love. After his abdication, Edward became known as the Duke of Windsor, a title that was specially created for him by his brother and successor, King George VI. He no longer held the responsibilities of a king, but his life continued to be a subject of public interest. Six months after his abdication, Edward married Wallace Simpson in France. Their wedding was a small and private affair, very different from the grand royal weddings we are used to seeing. It was a simple ceremony, attended only by a small group of close friends. The royal family did not attend the wedding, a sign of their disapproval of Edward's decision. Edward and Wallace spent most of their married life in France, far away from the pomp and ceremony of the British court. They lived a life of relative luxury, surrounded by high society. However, Edward was often said to be a man without a country. Despite his comfortable lifestyle, he was a former king living in exile. In their new life, Edward and Wallace remained a subject of fascination for the public. They were often photographed at parties and events. Their lifestyle seemed glamorous and carefree, but there were also rumours of loneliness and regret. Edward was reportedly unhappy about his separation from his family and his homeland. Despite the controversy and the challenges, Edward and Wallace stayed together until Edward's death in 1972. Wallace lived for another 14 years, dying in 1986. They are buried together at the Royal Burial Ground near Windsor Castle, a final resting place that reflects Edward's royal heritage. Edward's life after abdication was a mix of luxury and exile, of freedom and loss. He got to live with the woman he loved, but he also had to live without the country he once ruled. His story is a reminder of the power of personal choices and the consequences they can have. It's a story of a man who was once a king, but who chose to be simply a man in love. Chapter 4 
Princess Margaret, the love she lost. Princess Margaret, the younger sister of Queen Elizabeth II, was born on August 21, 1930. She was the second daughter of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, later known as the Queen Mother. Her early years were a time of great change for the royal family and for Britain as a whole. Margaret's childhood was marked by the unexpected ascension of her father to the throne after the abdication of her uncle, King Edward VIII. This event thrust her family into the public eye and significantly altered the course of Margaret's life. Suddenly, she was not just the daughter of a duke, but a royal princess, the daughter of a king. Despite these changes, Margaret's early years were relatively normal by royal standards. She was educated at home with her sister by a governess, focusing on subjects like history, languages and the arts. She showed an early interest in music and was an accomplished pianist. Known for her vivacious personality and quick wit, Margaret was much more outgoing and flamboyant than her older sister. She loved social events and was often the life of the party. Her charisma and charm made her popular among the people, but her rebellious spirit sometimes got her into trouble. Princess Margaret was also known for her beauty. She had a unique style and was often regarded as a fashion icon. Her glamorous image and her lively personality made her the focus of media attention, with newspapers and magazines eager to cover her latest activities. However, beneath the glamorous exterior, Margaret was a complex individual. She was known to be sensitive and could be very private. She also felt the pressures of her royal status. Being the Queen's younger sister meant living in the shadow of the throne, a position that often came with its own challenges and disappointments. One of these challenges was the expectation to make a suitable marriage. For a royal princess, choosing a husband was not just a personal decision, but a matter of state. Margaret's choice would need to be someone who could handle the pressures of royal life and who would be accepted by the royal family and the public. Little did she know that this expectation would lead to one of the most heartbreaking decisions of her life. Margaret's youth was a mix of privilege and duty, of joy and heartbreak. It was a time that shaped her into the woman she would become, a woman known for her glamour and her charm, but also for her resilience and her strength in the face of adversity. Princess Margaret's love life was marked by two major relationships that captured the public's imagination and led to significant heartbreak for the princess. The first was with Group Captain Peter Townsend, a Royal Air Force officer and war hero who had served as an equerry to her father, King George VI. Townsend was a divorced man, 16 years older than Margaret. Their love affair began when Margaret was in her early 20s. It was a scandalous relationship for its time, given Townsend's status as a divorcee and the Church of England's disapproval of remarriage after divorce. When their relationship became public, it caused a media frenzy. Margaret wanted to marry Townsend, but the political, religious and societal pressures were immense. The government, the church and some members of the royal family were against the marriage. Faced with the choice between duty and love, Margaret eventually chose duty. In 1955, she publicly announced that she had decided not to marry Townsend. This was a heartbreaking decision for the princess, who had to sacrifice her personal happiness for the sake of her position and her family. The second significant relationship in Margaret's life was with Anthony Armstrong Jones, a photographer she met in 1958. They were married in 1960, the first royal wedding to be televised. The couple had two children, David and Sarah. However, their marriage was not a happy one. There were rumours of infidelity on both sides, and they led increasingly separate lives. Margaret and Armstrong Jones divorced in 1978, marking the first royal divorce since King Henry VIII in the 16th century. Margaret never remarried. 
She lived the rest of her life as a single woman, focusing on her royal duties and her children. She continued to be a prominent figure in British society, known for her glamorous lifestyle and her strong character. Princess Margaret's love life was marked by intense passion and equally intense heartbreak. She was a woman who loved deeply and lost greatly. Her story is a poignant reminder of the conflicts between personal desires and public duty, and the sacrifices that come with being a member of the royal family. Despite the heartbreak and the disappointments, Margaret remained a strong and resilient woman, a princess who lived her life with courage and determination. After her divorce, Princess Margaret embarked on a new chapter of her life, one marked by a growing sense of independence and self-determination. She was no longer part of a royal couple. She was now a single woman, free to live her life on her own terms. Margaret's post-divorce years were characterized by a notable increase in her royal duties. She represented the Queen at numerous public events, both in the UK and abroad, showcasing her commitment to her royal role. She also focused on her personal interests, particularly her love for the arts. She was a patron of several arts organizations, and her support played a significant role in promoting British culture and creativity. However, Margaret's newfound freedom was not without its challenges. The public scrutiny that had always been a part of her life intensified. Her relationships, her lifestyle, and even her health became fodder for media speculation. Yet, Margaret handled this attention with a grace and dignity that earned her respect from many quarters. Her personal life also took on a new dimension. She formed new friendships and relationships, maintaining a vibrant social life. She was often seen at high-profile events and parties where her style and charisma shone. Despite the heartbreaks of her past, she seemed determined to enjoy her life to the fullest. Margaret also devoted much of her time and energy to her children. She was a loving mother, deeply involved in their upbringing. Despite the breakdown of her marriage, she and her ex-husband, Anthony Armstrong Jones, worked together to ensure their children had a stable and supportive environment. Margaret's later years were marked by health problems, which led to a gradual withdrawal from public life. However, she never lost her spirit or her sense of duty. Despite her challenges, she remained committed to her royal role until her death in 2002. Princess Margaret's life after her divorce was a testament to her strength and resilience. She faced her challenges head-on and carved out a life for herself that was uniquely hers. Her journey was not without its difficulties, but she navigated these with grace and determination. In her independence, she found a way to balance her personal desires with her public duties, living a life that was both fulfilling and meaningful. Chapter 5 Life in a Palace A Royal Childhood Growing up royal is a unique experience, very different from the typical childhood. From the moment they are born, royal children are thrust into the public eye. Their births are celebrated not just by their families, but by entire nations. Their milestones, their first words, their first steps, their first days of school, become matters of public interest. It's a life of privilege, but also a life of immense pressure and scrutiny. Royal children are raised in grand palaces, surrounded by centuries of history. They grow up in the same rooms where kings and queens have lived, under the watchful eyes of portraits of their ancestors. These palaces are more than just homes. They are symbols of the monarchy's continuity and the child's place in this historical lineage. Education is a key aspect of a royal childhood. Royal children are often educated at home in their early years, learning from tutors and governesses. Their education covers a wide range of subjects, from history and languages to arts and sports. They are also taught about their future roles and responsibilities, 
preparing them for the duties they will one day inherit. Despite the grandeur of their surroundings, efforts are made to give royal children as normal a childhood as possible. They have playdates, birthday parties, and family outings. They have hobbies, favourite books, and cherished toys. These everyday experiences help ground them and give them a sense of normalcy amidst their extraordinary circumstances. Yet, even these normal activities are often tinged with the awareness of their royal status. Their playdates are with the children of other royals or aristocrats. Their outings are carefully planned to avoid unwanted public attention. Their lives are a delicate balance between the ordinary and the extraordinary, the personal and the public. Growing up royal also involves learning about the importance of service. From a young age, royal children are taught about the monarchy's role in serving the people. They attend public engagements with their parents, meeting people from all walks of life. These experiences help instill in them a sense of duty and a commitment to public service. A royal childhood is a unique mix of privilege and pressure, of history and duty, of the ordinary and the extraordinary. It's a childhood that prepares them for the unique roles they will one day play as representatives of their family, their heritage and their nation. Education is a crucial part of a royal child's upbringing. It prepares them for their future roles and responsibilities and equips them with the knowledge and skills they will need in their public and private lives. In the early years, Royal children are often educated at home by a governess or private tutors. This ensures a personalised education that meets the specific needs of each child. Subjects taught include the standard curriculum of reading, writing and arithmetic, but also extend to languages, arts, history and lessons about the monarchy and their future duties. While they do have access to the best tutors and resources, royal children's education isn't limited to academic learning. There's a strong focus on character education, teaching them values such as respect, kindness and humility. They are also taught about the importance of public service, a core value of the monarchy, and are often involved in charitable activities from a young age. In recent generations, Royal children have attended formal schools outside the palace. This shift started with Prince Charles, who was the first heir to the British throne to attend a regular school. This move towards a more traditional education is seen as an effort to give royal children a sense of normalcy and allow them to interact with children from different backgrounds. However, attending school doesn't mean an end to their unique education. They continue to receive special lessons on constitutional matters and royal protocols. They are also trained in public speaking and media handling, skills that are crucial in their roles as public figures. Alongside their education, royal children also face high expectations from their family and the public. They are expected to excel in their studies, to behave impeccably, and to handle their royal duties with grace and maturity. These expectations can be a source of pressure, but they are also seen as necessary preparation for their future roles. From their early years, royal children are groomed for their future roles. Their education and upbringing are tailored to prepare them for the unique challenges and responsibilities they will face as members of the royal family. It's a process that requires careful balance, providing them with a solid education and strong values, while also allowing them the space to grow and develop as individuals. Despite their unique upbringing, royal children are still children, with their own stories of mischief, wonder and charm. These childhood stories, often shared by the royal family themselves, provide a glimpse into the more personal side of royal life. One such story involves Prince William, who was known for his lively and adventurous spirit. Once, when he was a young boy, he got his head stuck in the palace railings while trying to reach a ball that had gone out of bounds. His bodyguards had to free him, 
a moment that brought a mix of laughter and worry. Prince Harry, William's younger brother, was also known for his spirited personality. As a child, he had a particular fondness for climbing trees in the palace gardens. His mother, Princess Diana, often shared stories of Harry's tree-climbing adventures, painting a picture of a boy full of energy and curiosity. Princess Charlotte, the daughter of Prince William and Kate Middleton, has her own charming story. When she was just a toddler, she was spotted by the press picking up a tiny snail during a public outing. Her fascination with the small creature, a common sight for many children, was a touching reminder that despite her royal status, she is just a child exploring the world around her. Prince George, Charlotte's older brother, once caused a stir when he was spotted feeding his dog, Lupo, some ice cream during a family outing. This innocent act led to a flurry of media attention and public discussions about the safety of dogs eating ice cream. It was a reminder of the intense scrutiny the royal children live under. The youngest of Prince William and Kate's children, Prince Louis, has been described by his mother as a very confident and cheeky little boy. One of his endearing moments was when he enthusiastically clapped for the healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic, a moment that was shared by millions. These stories bring the royal children closer to the public. They show that despite their unique circumstances, they share the same joys, curiosities, and mischiefs of children everywhere. These childhood stories humanize the royal family, reminding us that beneath the crowns and the titles, they are just people, people with their own stories, their own personalities, and their own experiences. Chapter 6 Interesting Tales from the Palace While the British royal family is often viewed with an air of seriousness and decorum, they, like any other family, have their fair share of funny and light-hearted moments. These amusing stories remind us that beneath the royal titles and duties, the members of the royal family are human beings with a sense of humour. One such incident involved Queen Elizabeth II and an unsuspecting tourist. While walking around the grounds of her Balmoral estate in Scotland, the Queen, dressed in casual attire, was approached by a group of American tourists who didn't recognise her. They asked if she lived around the area and if she'd ever met the Queen. With a twinkle in her eye, the Queen pointed to her protection officer and said, No, but he has. Prince Philip, the Queen's late husband, was known for his sharp wit and sense of humour. During a visit to Australia, he was asked if he wanted to stroke a cola beer. His reply, Oh no, I might catch some ghastly disease. His dry humour often brought a touch of lightness to formal occasions. Prince Harry, known for his playful nature, once pranked his grandmother, the Queen, by changing her voicemail greeting to a humorous message. According to royal biographer Brian Hoey, the Queen took the joke in good humour and even allowed the message to remain for a few days. Prince William and his brother Harry also shared a light-hearted moment during William's wedding to Kate Middleton. As the bride walked down the aisle, Harry turned to his brother and said, Wait till you see her. These words, caught by lip readers, showed the strong bond and playful relationship between the brothers. Even the typically reserved Queen Mother had her moments of hilarity. Once, when her horse won a race, she was so excited that she dropped her racing programme from the royal box. Unfazed, she reportedly said, Oh, I'll get another one. There are plenty more. These funny stories reveal a more relaxed side to the royal family. They show their capacity for humour, their ability to laugh at themselves, and their appreciation for life's lighter moments. They remind us that, despite the grandeur of their lives, the royals are, at heart, people who can appreciate a good laugh. Despite the constant public attention, there are aspects of the royal family's life that remain less known or unseen. These moments, 
whether they are touching displays of affection, instances of vulnerability, or simply everyday occurrences, provide a deeper understanding of the royals as individuals and as a family. One of these unseen moments involves the Queen and her love for animals. The Queen is known for her fondness for Corgis, but what many people may not know is that she personally feeds her dogs and takes them for walks around the palace grounds. This personal care for her pets is a touching reminder of the Queen's softer, more personal side. Another lesser-known fact is the royal family's participation in normal household tasks. Prince William and Kate Middleton, for instance, are known to cook their own meals and do their own grocery shopping. They believe in giving their children a sense of normalcy and teaching them the value of self-sufficiency, despite their royal status. Prince Charles, known for his passion for the environment, spends a lot of his private time tending to the gardens of his residences. He particularly enjoys growing his own vegetables and has even introduced a line of organic produce under his Duchy Originals brand. The royal family also has their own traditions that are kept away from the public eye. One such tradition is their annual Christmas gift exchange, which happens on Christmas Eve in accordance with their German heritage. The gifts are typically humorous and inexpensive, a tradition that encourages fun and camaraderie rather than extravagance. Perhaps one of the most touching unseen moments was when Prince Harry was spotted comforting a grieving boy during a charity event. The boy had lost his mother and Harry, who lost his own mother at a young age, spent time with the boy, offering comfort and understanding. This moment, though not widely publicised, showed Harry's compassion and empathy, qualities that aren't always visible in his public role. These unseen moments peel back the royal veneer and offer a glimpse into the private lives of the royal family. They remind us that beyond the grand palaces, the ceremonial duties, and the public expectations, the royals are individuals with their own passions, their own struggles, and their own moments of joy and sorrow. They add depth to our understanding of the royal family and make their lives more relatable and human. The history and experiences of the royal family offer valuable insights and lessons that can be applied to our own lives. Their stories of perseverance, duty, love and resilience serve as examples of how to navigate life's challenges and triumphs. One important lesson comes from Queen Elizabeth II's long reign. Her commitment to duty and her steadfast dedication to serving her country are a testament to the value of commitment and perseverance. She has weathered many storms, both personal and political, and her strength in times of adversity provides a valuable lesson in resilience and dedication. Prince Charles' environmental advocacy teaches us about the importance of caring for our planet. His dedication to promoting sustainable farming and his work on climate change demonstrate how we can use our influence to make a difference and advocate for causes we believe in. The love story of King Edward VIII, who abdicated the throne for love, reminds us of the power of personal values. His decision to prioritise his personal happiness over his royal duty is a powerful lesson in following one's heart, even when it goes against societal expectations. Princess Diana's humanitarian work teaches us about compassion and the power of using our platform to help others. Her commitment to helping those in need, from landmine victims to people with AIDS, shows the impact one person can make when they use their influence for good. Prince William and Kate Middleton's decision to give their children a normal upbringing, despite their royal status, provides a lesson in parenting. It shows the importance of instilling values like humility and self-sufficiency in children, regardless of their background. Finally, the royal family's ability to balance tradition with modernity is a lesson in adaptability. They have maintained centuries-old traditions while also adapting to the changing world, showing the importance of respecting the past 
while also embracing the future. The royal family's experiences and history are rich with lessons that are applicable to our own lives. Their stories teach us about the importance of duty, the power of love, the value of compassion, the significance of personal values, and the necessity of adaptability. These lessons, learned from observing the royals, add a layer of depth to our understanding of the royal family and their role in society.